201, O Come All Ye Faithful. It is December the 1st. Let's stand if you're able to join me. 201, O Come All Ye Faithful. O come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the king of angels. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. On the second, sing choirs of angels. Sing in exaltation, sing all ye citizens of heaven above. Glory to God, all glory in the highest. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. 201 on the third. Yea, Lord, we greet thee, born this happy morning. Jesus, to thee be all glory given. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Let's open in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do come to adore you this evening. We thank you for this service midweek and pray, Lord, that it might serve as encouragement to our hearts. Lord, as we take time to pray one for another and lift up these requests before you, Lord, again, we ask for your mercy. We ask for your grace. Lord, please help meet the needs that we have in a way that only you can meet. Lord, we are grateful to be your children. And I pray, Lord, that we would live lives that are honoring unto you. We ask that you be with the kids downstairs with expeditions and um, allow them to be encouraged and challenged in their faith. Father, we pray for those that are not able to be with us this evening and just ask that you might encourage their hearts. May they know that we miss them and that we do continue to still pray for them. It's in Christ's name we ask. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm going to give you briefly a couple of announcements, and then I'll have you turn to the second hymn if you want to get a jump on it. It's 205, just a few pages forward from where you were. Infant, holy, infant, lowly. I will mention without reading all of the cards because I have read them uh, already once, but I'll, in case you missed them, we have from Brace Massey, a thank you note to the church family. We have from Michelle Cronin, thank you note to the church family. These would be the college care packages. Uh, Michael Cap, and then we have uh, another one, Brace Massey. He's extra thankful. We have one from Emma. We have one from Nathan Siegel. We have one from Julia Remelgado. I did want to include the one from um, the Foldies, our missionaries to Haiti. I'll put that on the back table so you can see that. And then um, this was a personal one, so I won't include that one in the mix. All right. So we'll go ahead and cover then the prayer bulletin at the end of the service. You can give me any updates and information that you might have. Right now, while you're still seated, let's sing 205, Infant Holy, Infant Low. On the first. Infant holy, infant holy, for his bed a cattle stall. 
Oxen lowing, little knowing, Christ the babe is Lord of all. Swift are winging, angels singing, no bells ringing, tidings bringing, Christ the babe is Lord of all. Christ the babe is Lord of all. On the second, flocks were sleeping, shepherds keeping, vigil till the morning noon. Saw the glory, heard the story, tidings of a gospel true. Thus rejoicing, free from sorrow, praise his voicing, greet the morrow. Christ the babe was born for you. Christ the babe was born for you. 289, it's not a chorus as much as it would be a hymn. Sorry, I don't. <laughs> My phone is now on silence. And I said sorry, and my phone thought I said Siri, so I started. <laughs> Turn off. All right. 289. Hallelujah. What a Savior. If you'd like to take a few moments and uh, mingle around and say hello to folks, even if from a distance, that's fine. Um, welcome any guests you might see or those that have been gone for a while. It's great to see you again. Welcome to the service this evening. 289. Hallelujah. What a Savior.
join in as you get your hymn book. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was he. Full atonement can it be. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was he to die, it is finished was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high, hallelujah, what a Savior. When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransomed home to bring. Then a new this song will sing, Hallelujah, what a Savior. Great singing, you may be seated. And I'll mention to you that if you'd like to give as far as tithes and offering this evening, you can simply put those in the box. It's located again on the lobby table on your way exiting the auditorium. We will cover the uh, updates and what we have from the prayer bulletin once I've cut the YouTube feed. If you're watching online right now and would like to send me new information or something maybe that it's been a couple of weeks since we've uh, met together and had our, our Wednesday evening prayer time. So let me know if we've missed something that you'd like included. And those that have already texted, I'll make sure to include that once I have cut the uh, the, the feed, but I am getting them, even though my phone is now on site. So thanks for setting those in. All right, let me just mention by way of upcoming birthdays, and uh, I don't have any anniversaries listed for December. Let me know if I'm off on that. If you happen to have an anniversary in December, please let me know. As far as birthdays, those that I have, and maybe there's others that are included in this grouping that I can add, but I have Krista Gavidia on the 9th, I have Trevor Cronin on the 16th, Ethan Gustafson on the 20th, and then Elizabeth Gustafson on the 31st. So happy birthday to these folks coming up. All right, let's go ahead and take our Bibles and turn together to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to continue our study through the book of 1 Corinthians. It's been a number of weeks since we've been together, so I will give you a quick recap. And way back in chapter 8, I had told you that when this day came... I was going to try to draw your attention back to where we had been. Uh, chapter 8, the whole summary, I'll give it to you quickly. It was, in case you weren't with us, it was the question that was posed to the Apostle Paul by those that were the believers at the church of Corinth. Obviously, there may have been a dispute over this, but is it lawful for an individual to eat meat that's offered to idols? So that was the pressing question at the time. And even though I had said way back when, Folks can easily dismiss the importance of chapter 8 and chapter 10 based off of saying, well, we're not having issues with offered uh, uh, meat offered to idols and, you know, one faction versus another faction on that topic. What we would miss out on, though, is the greater principle of spiritual maturity and then immaturity. So that section I had titled when me makes way for maturity, when me makes way for maturity. And in chapter 8, it was Paul's explanation to them as to the reasonings why, yes, meat offered to idols, it, it might be cheaper in the temple as far as where it was formerly offered to the idol, and now it is simply meat, so you get a discount on it. Um, it's not actually uh, been altered in any way. It was just offered to idols. And since the Corinthian believers, some of them, were making the case that the idols, they're, they're not reality. They're not they're not alive. They're not real. Why would this be a problem? If you can save a few bucks on the uh, the food instead of paying full price in the market, wouldn't that be a good thing? 
But Paul starts to make the case as far as not offending the weaker brother and then kind of ends chapter eight with the summary that if it would be better for the weaker brother and to not offend the weaker brother, he would refrain from utilizing that as the source of meat. In essence, uh, it would be better to pay more for the meat in the market than less for the meat at the temple because the issue isn't the meat so much. The issue is the brother in Christ who's going to potentially have a stumbling point over this or become even weaker in faith or um, have issues within their faith. Then in chapter 9, that was kind of the quick summary of 8. And then in chapter 9, he gives a personal explanation using himself as the illustration. So to make the point as to just because you could do something doesn't mean you should do something. He uses himself and says to the church at Corinth, really, that, that as far as them paying him when he was there ministering to them, that he could have demanded that from them, but he chose not to. Some of the reasons specifically that he could have said, hey, um, having financial support from you really is something that you ought to consider. He could have said in chapter nine, verses one through six, that I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. So as an apostle of Christ, would you not want to support me then in that regard as I minister to you? That would logically be a, a good point to be made. The second was that in verse seven of the principle of investment and dividends. And he gives he gives kind of an explanation with that, that regarding the things of this world, there's a number of, of illustrations all in that one verse that, that we understand this from a different worldly, uh, if you will, carnal perspective. So if it's if it's our, our men and women in the military and they're going to go serve abroad in another country, um, do they have to secure their own airfare? Well, no, we're paying for that. Tax dollars pay for that. The government is going to take care of them as one who is serving. So he, he gives the illustration of who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges. Who, who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? So investment. Dividends. There's a point to be made with that. I see that. The third thing, verses 8 through 12, he gets clearly from the reference in Deuteronomy, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. The Old Testament principles on this would say that the church at Corinth should have given proper financial support to the Apostle Paul. The fourth thing is that the lives of the priests in chapter 9, verse 13, do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple. So he's going back to the Aaronic priesthood and that God had a set order for them as far as being taken care of as God's servants. Number five, the lesson of the Lord points to this. In chapter 14, he says, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. I gave you two instances where Christ was utilizing that same principle and he was publicly sharing that while he was on earth. So then the transition, beginning in verse really 15 through 18, even though he's made the case with five different points as to why he could have said, hey, financial support from the church there at Corinth uh, would have been right. It would have been within, quote, his power. That's kind of the, the key word in the Greek. Is this my right? Do I have the right to do this? Is this within my power? He then starts to shift it. He, he gloried in the cross of Christ and the gospel, not financial remuneration. His desire, his glory, it was in the cross of Jesus Christ. He wasn't just trying to establish for himself a name based off of the financial help that they could give. Verses 15 through 18 shared that. The next point he makes, as far as why he did not, verses 19 through 23, Paul sought after the souls of men, not financial remuneration. So yet again, he gloried in the cross of Christ. He's seeking the souls of men. And I think for all of us, whether it's pastor or people within the congregation, we have to ask ourselves the simple question, what is our greatest motivator? Is it, is it, is it finances? Do we, do we use ministries? As a means of gain, do we, I mean, I'm not taking away that this church supports me financially. I'm simply saying, do we try to use it almost like if I can use the phrase, like a pyramid scheme? 
that you kind of you're, you're going to leverage ministry so that in the end you can simply build for yourself. Sadly, there are so many poor examples of that. There are so many um, wrong examples where that's exactly what's happened. And, and you know, it speaks in First Timothy, Paul writing to young Timothy, that there are those that are at times trying to supposing that godliness is gain. Literally, that the opportunity is advantageous for them to make a buck. Well, think about how that would have affected those early Christians in Corinth, especially those that were maybe immature in their faith. Even though Paul could have, he chose not to. Because he understood that maybe at that point, at that point in time, it wouldn't have been the best thing for their growth to mature in the faith. Paul sought after the souls of men, not just financial remuneration. Thirdly, verses 24 through 27, where we ended last time some weeks ago, Paul understood that good can often sidetrack those who are seeking the best. This is such a key point, and it's one that we have to understand. And I tried to, I tried to highlight that I think in our church, I, I think because my, my thoughts towards you would be that that we're not just struggling with wickedness versus that which is good. I hope that's not where we're at. I hope that we're not just on such a low plane and, and immature spiritually that our day-to-day -day debate in the flesh is between uh, that which we know is completely against God's word, it's evil, and then that which is good. I think for most of us, what we face day to day is the struggle between good and best. I think, I think most of the time to give folks the benefit of the doubt, I can't speak for everybody, but I, I don't know that folks are maybe on that, that lowest tier where it's choosing between uh, uh, living for God and the licentiousness of the world. I don't, I don't know that that's where it's at. I think many times we get tripped up because we so easily see that which is good. We settle for good rather than going for best. And I struggled with this many years ago, and it was when I was praying about what the Lord would have me to do. And and I wasn't, I wasn't trying to pursue something. I was, I was at a Christian college and I was a declared pre-law major. It wasn't that that was carnal. Some might argue with me. <laughs> Some would say there's, there's no good lawyers. Well, I, I wanted to be a good one. I wanted, I wanted to be a Christian lawyer. My dad had taught me, and I can't tell you how many times I remember dad even emphasizing this truth. My dad wasn't an engineer who happened to be a Christian. My dad was a Christian who happened to be an engineer. My dad wasn't called to preach. He wasn't a pastor, but he was absolutely a follower of Jesus Christ. And his testimony was strong. And, and again, he, my dad didn't preach messages from pulpits. I didn't grow up as a, as a little PK, a pastor's kid or an MK, a, a missionary's kid. But I saw in my dad that his faith was strong. And as a non-pastor, non-missionary, he was a Christian who happened to be an engineer. And I struggled with this because I felt like, well, I like to, I like to study. I, I enjoy reading. I enjoy um, debate. My brother and sister would tell you I love to debate. Uh, we had healthy debates in our house, and, and uh, I don't know that anybody ever won, but Elizabeth will tell you that when we first met and then she came to the house, she had visited one time, and we were all together as a family, and later on, it wasn't it wasn't like a heated exchange with me and my my family. But later on, she'd said, wow, she's like, when you guys say something at the dinner table, you better be able to back it up. Because like everyone's gonna, everyone's going to like pounce on that. You better have three reasons in a poem to stand on why you made that point. I mean, how dare you think blue is better than red? I'll give you five reasons why red's better. And she just saw from the beginning, wow, you know, and. I, would, I asked her, I'm like, well, so that's not how it is in your family? She's like, no, no, we're not. <laughs> we're, not we're not really like that so much. We just kind of like let people share. <laughs> and they can share from the heart, and they like blue when I like red, and that's okay. We're okay with that. I'm like, well, I always felt the need to convince the other person my blue was better, <laughs> whatever it was. The struggle, the struggle with the area of the debate, it wasn't that there was anything wrong if I had been a lawyer. It wasn't that there's anything wrong with debating blue over red or Ford over Chevy or whatever the case might be. The problem is, 
Is that what God wanted me to do? And if you have ventured into something and you've not taken it before the Lord in prayer, not truly, I can't tell you, I won't tell you that I didn't ever pray about it. I did pray about it, and the Lord had actually convicted me earlier, and I was still kind of pushing against what God had convicted me about earlier. And that's a miserable spot to be. And then when the Lord really got a hold of my heart, December the 6th of 1994, the surrender of that day at the end of a chapel message that it's not like the chapel speaker knew me or knew my quandary or knew what was on my heart. But that day I felt that the victory, it wasn't between evil and good. Good won out. I didn't get into wickedness and sin and depravity. It was between good and best and surrendering to the Lord. With this, there was the area of what I had shared with you. If you want to be an elite runner, there are some things you have to say goodbye to. Not because they're wrong, but because they're not the best in succeeding and reaching the goal that you have. So notice in chapter 9, as he's concluding, he gives the illustrations. It wasn't just me going on a tangent. He says, I therefore so run. Why is he saying, I therefore? It's hearkening back to verse 25. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, that, that wreath that would wither, but we an incorruptible. I therefore, I, Paul says, that's how I'm going to run. Not as uncertainly. I'm not going to run with doubt. I'm not going to run with this wishy-washy, back and forth, I don't know who I am type of a perspective. And one of the things that I absolutely can tell you, with, it was as plain as the nose on my face, which I know is very plain. When I surrendered to the Lord in this area and I went down to the registrar's office and I changed my major, I changed my major before I called my mom and my dad. And I claimed Galatians 5, 16. I didn't want to confer with flesh and blood and have it that I was going to somehow get talked out of what I knew the Lord was having me to do. I was nervous about mom and dad's response. Mom and dad's response elated my heart because they were so happy that I was following God's will in that regard. They, they cared zero about whether it was pre-law or whatever avenue it was. They simply wanted their son follow after what is best. God's best. Go after that. And when you go after it, go after it with your whole heart. I had given you from the uh, the book, which I won't, if you were not with us, it's, uh, it's Dr. Noakes and it's um, The Lore of Running. It's about a 20 pound book on all things running. You'd think there's not enough to talk about to have a 20 pound, 500 page book, but there is. And they have it down to the nuances of those that want to be the elite runners. And I made my case that I'm not going to be an elite runner. I do think I was polishing off some Entenmann's donuts when I was reading the book. It doesn't mean Entenmann's crumb top donuts are sinful. They're, they're not sinful. You're not going to be an elite runner, though, polishing off Entenmann's crumb top donuts. If you expect to be able to say, OK, I'm right at six foot, so I'm supposed to be uh, I'm supposed to be uh, at 72 inches and it's two pounds per inch. I'm supposed to be no more than 144 pounds. Well, I've missed the mark. I'm, and I'm not going to try to make that mark. So I have to assess then, all right, is this my goal? Now, you might say, well, good for me. I don't want to be an elite runner. Okay, but do you want to be a godly Christian? Do you want to run with uncertainty or do you want to run with certainty? Do you want your confidence to be then in your own abilities or do you want your confidence to be in Christ? Do you want to be able to say at the end of life that I pursued that which was good I hit the mark of good or I followed the Lord and it was best. I finished my course with that. It goes into chapter 10 and you might say that's a strange interlude. But notice, even though, yes, it does link chapter eight and 10 together. Moreover, brethren, I would not have ye sh that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock. And you'll notice if you happen to have a Schofield, you have a superscript H and in the column in the middle, the capital R for rock, it's Christ. It's not just a physical rock, Christ that followed them. And that rock was Christ that then goes on to explain. Now in this section, you might say, well, it's kind of a strange tangent thought. 
that it goes from him saying, I want to run with certainty. I want to run not as one who is beating the air with my fists. I want to have an effect on what I'm hitting. I, I didn't coin the phrase, but it we can either live life that is disciplined and focused and directed, or as one would say, that we are hitting everywhere and hard nowhere. That, that there's no one area of our life that we're actually nailing down what God would have for us. It's kind of like those carnival games, you know, it's got like this little head of a woodchuck and it keeps popping up in the holes and you always feel like you're just kind of slapping at stuff. But at the end, you really haven't accomplished much. You've, you've just been kind of going after in a crisis fashion what it was that was immediately popping up rather than being focused in that regard. He gives the case for us, not me. Verse 27, what was his fear? He says, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. That becomes the basis leading into chapter 10. His fear of saying, hey, in a position of confidence, in a position of knowing my rights, knowing what's within my power, having maturity of faith that I would then, having preached to others, I become a castaway. Remember the word castaway was disqualified. He's using the illustration of running. So I become disqualified because I've not maintained by faith what I knew to be right and what I actually had preached then to others. This leads to chapter 10, which I've titled this, The Forewarning on Failure. And then I would say, just make a note, if you happen to make the title, The Forewarning on Failure, just put a note with parentheses, verse 12. I would say that 1 Corinthians 10, 31 is probably the most famous verse out of this, especially if you work at the Wilds Christian Camp for a summer or two. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Yes, that actually pertained to the whole topic of chapter 8, meat offered to idols. Whether you do or whether you don't. It isn't just like, well, we said that three times a day in the dining hall. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And we always applied it to the food that we were about to eat. It's a great application. It's not necessarily the interpretation of that verse. But even though 1 Corinthians 10.31 might be the, in my opinion, it's just my opinion. It means nothing. Maybe the most popular verse. I think verse 12 has to be a close second. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. This is the forewarning on failure. And remember, I think that the angle that he is approaching this are to the spiritually mature. He's made the case to them back in chapter 8. Is it within your power? Sure, it's within your power. Is it within your right to do this? Sure, it's within your right to do this. Is it the best thing to do? Hmm, that could be debated. Let me give you an illustration. As far as the pay that I could have demanded of you, I'm an apostle. The Old Testament spoke of it. Christ spoke of it. That's how the priests maintained their, their sustenance and livelihood. So these are great excuses, but I chose not to do it. I was more focused on glorying in the cross, on seeing souls one for Christ and understanding that in the end, it's not between evil and good. It's between good and best. And the best choice for your sakes in that regard was that I not take financial remuneration. But instead of it just being that we preach to others and we know where we stand on that, and then we ourselves become the castaway, he begins with an illustration. And the first point in this section, which is all that we're going to accomplish with tonight, the first thing I want you to see in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4, we are bound for failure if we consider God's blessings as promise of success. Folks, I, I can't tell you how many times individuals within ministries, not giving specific names, I'm not going to give specific organizations, but individuals have cited God's hand of blessing on the ministry. And God was allowing the ministry to prosper, and it was growing, and it was developing, and People's lives were being touched and reached, and there were good things that were happening. Now, I do not know the heart of other individuals. I, I will not say, well, here's what happened. 
they started to, I can't say that. I could only speak for myself and my own heart and areas that I get tempted. But let me make two basic points. The first being this, as believers, we are tempted every day to overemphasize our spiritual abilities and we underestimate the pull of the flesh. Let me read that again. We're tempted every day to overemphasize our spiritual abilities and we underestimate the pull of the flesh. Well, you know, I mean, I'm not, I didn't just get saved yesterday. I've been saved for some time and here I am in the church in Corinth it's just silly to me that we're paying more for the meat. So I'm going to write Paul, and I'm just going to make the case. <laughs> These people are spiritually immature. That's what they are. We're kind of having this little debate here over whether or not we should pay more for the meat in the you know, marketplace or whether we can just go to the temple where it was offered to the idols. And by the way, there's a whole lot of other stuff that's going on in the temple that you're aware of that's not good. I mean, you can save some money. It's discount meat. You'd be foolish to pay extra for your meat. And frankly, I mean, I have no problem. The idols are nothing. They're not reality. It means nothing to me. I can save a buck. And I think, frankly, they just need to get over it. They're, they're immature spiritually. And then you find that individuals get tripped up in things along the way. They overestimate their spiritual abilities. It's when we start to believe that even though we know there's wrong there or it's not best, we start to overestimate our ability to say no to it. We see God's blessings as his approval of who we are and what we're doing. And it makes it easier to become proud. And it makes it easier to resort to the flesh and forget that we are all in our humanity. We are so desperately in need of God's grace. No matter how many years we have been saved, and no matter how much has been done in a ministry that we were a part of or in the lives of other people, folks, may we never forget our flesh is strong and that it's alive and that temptations can allure us and pull us you might be able to say, hey, I've been saved for not just years. I've been saved for decades. I've been saved for over a half a century. Folks, that's the warning of verse 12. To him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Lest having preached to others, we ourselves become disqualified. Run with a purpose. Run with an integrity that understands that the more that we might do for the Lord in wanting to serve the Lord, you understand the bullseye is getting larger on your back. It's not getting smaller. And for those that are in ministries and heads of Christian colleges, we need to be praying for them. Pray that the Lord would keep them pure. Pray that the Lord would keep them right. Pray that the Lord would allow them to remain humble. That the Lord would use them in a right way, but that God would get the glory and that man wouldn't somehow start to believe what people write about him or her in the press. I've tried to highlight this before, but I think I may have been wrong in the illustration. Would it, sports fans, have been, was it, was it uh, Vince Lombardi who had said to his football team that the problem with them was that they started to believe the press? Does anybody remember? New Rockney, Vince Lombardi? Eli Manning? I don't know. I don't see that's the danger of me using a sports illustration. I don't have a clue what I'm talking about, but somebody somewhere said something similar. <laughs> it was something like that. Bottom line, there's a football coach. Somebody's gonna have to Google this for me. The football coach that was getting on to his team because they were losing, and in the end, they had been believing the accolades of those that were writing the press about them. That they're so great, they're so wonderful, in essence, that this is a paraphrase. That, they're, that they, you know, no team can beat them. And then they lose. And he says that the problem is that you're, believe, you're believing it. You're believing what's being said about you. Rather than taking every single game as it is an opportunity of either winning or losing. You, you walked into it believing that I'm always going to win. Because we've been winning. I mean, our record is such and such, therefore... Why would this be any different? I remember playing soccer. I remember running track. There were those great times of victory as a team. And then there were those humiliating times when we lost to teams that I have no idea why we lost. 
other than the fact that the Lord was desperately trying to humble us. We had become proud. We had let our guard down. We had felt somehow that it was an impossibility that we were going to lose to that team. I remember distinctly my track coach, man, he was giving it to us on the on the bus going home. It was Barberton that we had lost to. Bar you're like, Barberton, that doesn't mean anything to me. I don't know that Barberton had ever won a track in the history of its school. How did we then lose to Barberton? Well, I think our ego said something to do with it. I think the fact that on the bus to Barberton, we thought it was a joke. We didn't actually even want to be there because we wanted to run against a real team. And then Barberton got um, a guy named Bronze Simpson. And if your name is Bronze Simpson, you just know he's fast. And he was. And I think that was his real name. It wasn't a nickname. And I'm pretty sure in his four events, somehow he got first in all four of them and helped lead his team to victory. We became proud. Mike, do you have a quote for me? Not yet. All right. So let's attribute it to me. I said that. I don't know who it is. <laughs> Two things, if in doubt, say that you said it or that Dr. Bob Sr. said it. Because you're going to land. If you don't, if it's a spiritual one, just say Dr. Bob once said, then everybody's going to buy it. Anyway, there is a quote out there somewhere involving a football coach, and I'm going to find it for you. But the truth of this spiritually, bringing it back down to reality, let me give it to you again. We are tempted every day to overemphasize our spiritual abilities and underestimate and pull up the flesh. We must be on guard as we stand in the faith. There may be areas of questionable decisions that have only weighed with the question, is it lawful? Remember, that's chapter eight. Is this lawful? Is this a problem? Like, what's wrong with this? Pastor, what's the problem? Is this against God's law? Is this lawful? If that is the only question we ask, we're showing our own immaturity instead of asking from the bigger picture of saying, is it best? Is this, is this best? Is this the best thing? Is this the best line of thinking? Do I need to follow this? Am I going to follow the spirit of God and the word of God? Or am I simply going to follow what, you know, is it lawful? The illustration that Paul gives to them stems from the children of Israel in the wilderness. You can clearly see it was through God's mighty hand that the children of Israel were delivered from the hand of Pharaoh in Egypt. Consider earlier, Paul had already drawn a parallel between the believer's redemption in Christ and the Passover. Back in chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ... Our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You'll see there in verse 1, the phrase passed through the sea. They, they passed through the Red Sea. Serves as a picture of the believer in baptism, which in verse 2 it says, and we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Remember, it was the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, and then going through the Red Sea. There was that picture of baptism that the believer understands today. The children of Israel had seen God's supernatural hand as well, and his blessing as it related to the food and the provision that he gave to them. It said in verse 3 and 4, all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Believers today are not out picking up manna from their lawns because that's not the spiritual food that the Lord is giving to us and providing us today. What has he given to us? Matthew 4, 4. But he answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I can't emphasize that enough. As much as it would be an incredible miracle, don't get me wrong. If you opened up your door tomorrow morning and instead of, you know, snow out on your lawn, you saw something else that was white and it was, uh, well, what is it in the Hebrew? It was manna and you went out and you tasted it and it was a cross between angel food and honey. You'd say, wow, this is incredible. God's providing. This is amazing. And here's what we fail to realize. You don't have to open your front door to look for angel food cake on your lawn. You've got the word of God. But many times we don't draw from it. Many times we don't take that which is best for our spiritual nourishment. Instead, we settle for good. 
We can get sidetracked with devotionals or other things rather than simply taking time in God's word. Am I saying devotionals are bad? No. I read from multiple devotionals every single day. They can be an encouragement. They can be a source of strength, but never substitute that for this. In Romans 15, 4, he says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. In John 6, 63, it's the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You'll remember that it was the whole passage in John chapter 6 where he was telling them, I'm the bread of life. You have to basically consume me. They completely missed the metaphor. And they felt that he's, what, instructing us in cannibalism? So in John 6, 66, they departed from them. Many of them left Christ and walked no more with him. They, they would have rather seen a physical manifestation, if you will, manna, than understand that the words that he gives, that's life. This is the strength. John 6, 68, then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. In John 7, 37 through 39, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Folks, it wasn't a physical rock that followed them. It was Christ who was leading them. There were times, and you know the accounts, Exodus 17, Numbers chapter 20, and then at the well in Numbers 21, that God did provide for their thirst from the rock. There was that supernatural act, the blessing. I can't imagine what that would have been like. I mean, around here, here in the Poconos, we have the rock on the side, I think over by the crossings, if you're on 611 head north, and, and you'll see at times, especially if it's uh, starting to kind of freeze or in early spring, it'll be kind of like gushing out of the side of the rock. It's pretty neat. In the wintertime, it just freezes. So you have this cascading ice um, uh, waterfall, but it's not water. It's just solid ice. I imagine hitting a rock and having two and a half million people um, it wasn't a trickle. How much did they thirst? How much would they drink? And then you had the cattle that would have been with them. God supernaturally met their need. And yet, the whole point that you're going to see, but, verse 5, but with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. There's a tremendous danger in claiming God's blessings at the same time that we're losing sight of who it is that gave them to us. This nearsightedness spiritually causes us to put more faith in our own flesh than in the Lord as the one who's meeting and supplying our needs. In spite of all these blessings, the children of Israel still sinned against God. The warning that he's giving is were there a group of people who tangibly could see greater blessings than the Old Testament Israelites? You have a cloud that leads you by day, a pillar of fire by night. You have manna on your lawn, and later on you get quail because you ask for meat. You get led through the Red Sea, and in all of this, the Lord provides. You have water that gushes out of the side of a solid rock face and you get to drink from it. But in that, and I get convicted when I see this and I don't ever want it to be that I'm somehow condemning the children of Israel. You know, given a bad flannel graph demonstration of children of Israel, hard hearted and bad. Yes, there was a cyclical problem that they had. And one that I know is also available in my own heart because I'm still marked by my humanity. I still have that flesh part of me. 
I could still go through periods of blessings and victory and see God's hand and not be 10 minutes beyond that and fight with myself in the flesh. I can find myself flesh versus spirit. Romans 7. I know Paul's sharing his testimony. I'm sharing my own right now. And with this, verse 12, as we get to it, there is this foreshadowing of failure. There's the forewarning of failure. When we become proud of our, quote, growth in Christ, or the blessings that we have in Christ, we're walking a dangerous path of failing Christ. I've used as an illustration, keeping the individual anonymous, but there was a pastor at one time who had said the words that there was really nothing new under the sun from the word of God that he would be able to convey. Kind of like he's, he's covered it all. It sounds unbelievable that a pastor would utter those words. I don't know how proud one has to be or how many degrees you have to attain behind your name before you feel that there's nothing else in the word of God that you can learn. Folks, if I pastor until the age of 95, I would tell you on that day, as I'm telling you on this day, I will never exhaust the word of God. I would dare say you could take a verse like John 3, 16 and say, hey, preach this for the rest of your life. Tell me if you ever get to the depth of it. I wouldn't be able to. Where does that come from? Where does that stem from? Oh, 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 I get it. You got the earned THM, your doctorate of theology. So, so then, wow. Well, let me step back and make way for you. You've, you've handled all these situations before. Sometimes I have a hard time when it seems that people are presenting their spiritual maturity as their selling point more than simply saying that it's by the cloak of humility that they wear that they want to be a servant for the Lord. I'm not broad brushing everybody and saying that that Satan's going to get in their heart and mind and, and bring those ministries down. But folks, let's just think about it. If there's a large ministry, Satan would love to see it crumble. If there's many lives being affected and many families and homes and children, he'd love to see it crumble. Satan would love to see the work of God suffer and to have the name of Christ drugged through the mud. It might have been, going back to chapter 8, that a strong, mature believer who felt that they were impervious to the temptations at the temple, the temple prostitutes and the other vices that would have been there, would genuinely seek nothing but a good deal on meat, yet walk away with an introduction to sin or find a hole in their life that they had never anticipated. Now, I'll keep this ultra vague and just give this in conclusion. There was an individual many years ago. He was serving in ministry, but yet at that time, his, his job was that of being a police officer. And he was describing some of the things that he was having to do. And, and we were having this discussion because I was actually riding along in the squad car and we had many hours together. He's born again, married, kids, serving in the church. And he was describing some of the things that he was having to do as an undercover police officer in that part of town. And I simply had made the statement that I would not do that. And he had said, well, you'd have to. It's your job. I said, I'd get a new job. He's like, well, <laughs> easy for you to say, you know, what, I was young, didn't know anything. I just said, I, um, being extremely vague, there's no way that I'm going to be able to be in that situation and somehow not have that affect me. So, no, that's a deal breaker. I wouldn't do it. He's like, well, you know, you know, I'm, it's not my, my first day on the job. He'd been on the force for many, many years. He's been saved for a long time. He preached many a sermon. He would do pulpit fill in churches. I just thought, no, I couldn't. It was uneasy. We stopped that conversation, went on to other things maybe that were a little bit more lighthearted. It'd be years later that I would learn that he had actually gotten involved in immorality through the very medium that he and I had discussed on that evening. 
that he felt that it was it was beyond the pale of him ever doing that. He was spiritually mature, kind of like you're young at the time. I would have been about 25. So you're young, you're inexperienced. You know, I can see why that might be that much more ominous to you. But, you know, somebody like myself, I'm trust me, I'm well established. And the details of that were horrific. And I know it grieved God's heart. I know it grieved the hearts of people that were in that church, of his family, his children, and those that were affected by that. And I've prayed, rather than lob arguments of condemnation towards that individual, I've simply prayed and said, Lord, help me not ever be in that place. Help me not somehow whittle down areas of temptation because I'm going to save a few bucks on meat that was offered to idols. I realize I speak in a very proverbial sense. I realize we don't have a an idol-worshiping temple nearby that's known for its prostitution. But I'm going to say if, if that's what's going on, um, it's no longer beneficial to me, even if it's within my parameters of, is that my right? Am I allowed to? I think that's where I'm just going to say, Lord, help me to be naive to those things that are sinful and wise unto those things that are godly. Help me if it's that in my own pride, I would be lifted up by my pride, then then restrain me. Refrain that from coming. If I'm not able to handle that and you foresee that there's going to be this problem, then, then, then don't allow that to be what I have. Allow me to remain humbled. Allow me to be usable. Allow me to be in a position that God can use my life for his glory. Otherwise, verse 27 of chapter 9 would come true. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, whatever the means might be, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Father, I pray that as we conclude this, you would help us to think of that one point. Simply because we have God's blessings in our life does not mean